Shield. America's favorite commercials. Their styles have changed, but their purpose remains the same. To get us to part with our money. I'm here to sell you protection. Kids are for kids. <laughs> probably find Nancy in the bedroom. Reading. She's ovulating tomorrow at about 4 o'clock. I'll be taking the afternoon off. Typical man. Look at my own blouses, for example. They're so white and bright. Whoever said underwear has to be white anyhow. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Since the 1950s, when families gathered around their television sets, commercials have been an integral part of entertainment. See the USA in your Chevrolet. We had to do commercials that were at least as close to as entertaining as the programs they were on. We started to realize that if we could entertain people, they'd remember the product that we were talking about. Performance is sweeter, nothing can beat her. Is completer in a Chevy. My baloney has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. You could sell almost anything and have a wit about it. After all, they're watching television to get entertained. Oh, I love to read it every day. If you ask me why, because Oscar Mayer has a way with the it is those commercials that make that emotional connection that somehow seem to come to mind in that very moment when you're making your, your selection. Uh, you can do it through music. You can do it through any number of techniques. I'd love to be an Oscar Mayer wiener. The worst thing that someone could do to your commercial is look at it and not respond. And I'm saying, laugh, damn it, cry, respond, do something, feel something. Throughout the years, we met characters like Madge, the manicurist. Listen, I'm a manicurist, not a magician. And Josephine, the plumber. Oh, Comet gets off stains better than any other leading cleanser. And we giggled with the certainty that the Trix rabbit wouldn't get his cereal. And Mean Joe Green would get his Coca-Cola. Green? Yeah. You, you need any help? Mm -hmm. I, I just want you to know, I think, I think you're the best ever. Yeah, sure. Want my Coke? It's okay, you can have it. No, no. Really, you can have it. Okay. Thanks. That's the way it should be. Advertisers constantly strive to make their commercials as entertaining as the shows they are in, but sometimes they even surpass them. Boy, am I hungry. What kind of soup is that? Make way for the great American soup. Can you give me that again? How fast the rich, they pass the word to 42nd Street. Make way for the great American soup. Hey, mister, have you tried the soup that's good enough to eat? Shake hands with the great American soup. Feel that river guide your feet on a soupy road to romance. Let's face the chicken gumbo and dance. Thank you.
who's got it food, who's got the life from Broadway to the loop. It's the great. Why do you always have to make such a big production out of everything? Humor in advertising has always been a very serious business. Here is Mr. Ernie Kovacs to present the commercial for Dutch Masters. Advertisers want you to laugh with, not at their product. If you laugh, you will absorb the name of the product deep into your being, where your inner shopper lives. Humor is very simple. Here's a basic joke. Cut. With a basic punchline. Cut. With one big laugh at the end of it. Beautiful work, doctor. Should have used Strem, the most dependable fishing line in the world. Even when you are expecting a laugh at the end of a commercial, Sometimes the punchline has a twist that may surprise you. Tricks. Tricks are for kids. <laughs> Finally, after all these years of tricks are for kids, tricks are for kids. Well, today. They're for rabbits. <laughs> when discussing humor in advertising, the experts all mention the same campaign. Using the Volkswagen commercial, which kind of everybody's kind of a textbook, here's how humor and advertising works, and it worked by, the humor itself gave a personality to that funny looking little car, that Beetle, that became almost like a friend. Volkswagen. 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 It was the most brilliant piece of advertising, because it shows a snowstorm. There's a commercial called Snowplow. The voiceover says, Have you ever wondered how the man who drives a snowplow drives to the snowplow? This one drives a Volkswagen. So you can stop wondering. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's just beautiful. The Volkswagen Carmen Ghia is the most economical sports car you can buy. It's just not the most powerful. The Volkswagen comedy campaign was so influential that many executives picked advertising as their profession because of it. I naturally, Snavely, being of sound mind and body, do hereby be glowing. To my wife, Rose, who spent money like there was no tomorrow, I leave $100 and a calendar. To my sons, Rodney and Victor, who spent every dime I ever gave them on fancy cars and fast women, I leave $50 in dime. To my business partner, Jules, whose only motto was spend, spend, spend. I leave nothing, nothing, nothing. And to my other friends and relatives who also never learned the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. Finally, to my nephew, Harold, who oft times said, a penny saved is a penny earned. And who also oft times said, gee, Uncle Max, it sure pays to own a Volkswagen. I leave my entire fortune of one hundred billion dollars. More and more companies are finding great success using humor in their advertising, in spite of a potential risk. I think people are afraid of humor because most, many advertisers are afraid that the humor itself will take over and overshadow the product. When really, uh, if done correctly, as with anything, if done correctly, it makes it and marks it indelibly. It's a very powerful tool. You really need to entertain people. You need to make them laugh or cry or feel something. And if you make them laugh, they probably won't turn the channel. They're probably going to get that iron fist and the velvet glove. They're going to get hit with something and not even know it because they're going to be entertained.
chillers. The process of creating a humorous campaign can often be funny in itself. And we'd get into a conference room, and we'd say, uh, well, this is the first commercial for you. And, say, uh, and there were smiles all waiting to hear the stuff they were going to fall down and laugh at. And say, uh, <clears throat> Honey, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. No, Ralph, I ate it. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Go take two Alka-Seltzer. Um, nobody was laughing. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. No, Ralph, I ate it. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. Take two Alka-Seltzer. So then we had to go proving to these clients that what we were reading to them was funny. It will be funny when it appeared on the air. Did you drink your Alka-Seltzer? Uh, oh, thing. Grocery cart. Even back in the early days of live television, funny commercials were part of the entertainment. <laughs> Just to take the top cans, Gene. Gene, I said the top cans. But I want this one, Steve. Right here. You can take that if you want, but if you do, you're just going to louse up the whole nice, neat demonstration. And there's no need to do that, because uh, every single can of Del Monte fruit cocktail is exactly the same. Every can is just brimming with wonderful big cuts of fruit. There's pineapple and peaches and cherries and pears and grapes, and it's great. Yeah, well, that's all fine and dandy, uh -huh. but I want this can. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Beginner's luck. I bet you can never do that again. But, Gene, surely you want more than one can of Del Monte uh, fruit cocktail, don't you? I mean, after all, there are so many ways to use fruit cocktail. So why don't you take it? <laughs> well, it just goes to show you, grocers just can't keep Del Monte fruit cocktail on their shelves. <laughs> One of the things that started many years ago and was tremendously effective, and to this day is still a very, very, very effective device, and that is the product demo, the product demonstration. And one of the examples of that was the old John Cameron Swayze series with Timex. We've attached my Timex directly to the propeller blade, as you see here. Now we'll submerge it in the tank. And all right, let's go. Now, just imagine, the Timex watch on that propeller, let's lift her out, has been slashed through the water on that blade to the tune of 4,500 revolutions per minute. What a test for a waterproof, shock-resistant watch. It was such a test that it threw the wa watch off in the tank, and I'm very sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, because we had it all arranged so you would get a picture of that sweep hand still working, as it did perfectly during numerous rehearsals here tonight, I assure you. Next time, we'll fasten it more securely, and I'll show it to you right on the blade. It's one more reason why more people buy Timex than any other watch in the world. So, uh, so you think there's going to be a next time, huh, John? <laughs> Trying to cut down on smoking? Switch to SK Quality Franks. All meat, no filler. Hickory smoked. Delicious barbecued. I'm down to a pack a day. The product demo commercial, whether intentionally funny or not, eventually evolved from a demonstration to a conversation. And then we sort of transitioned into the bright idea that, uh, hey, wait a minute, why don't we talk like real people talk on television? Hey, Scott! How come all of a sudden your hands look like a girl? I could die. What's doing it? Ah, that dove for dishes. The wife's away, and I've been doing the dishes in the dove. Why? What's in it? What kind of hand motion stuff? Listen. 
If I close my eyes, will you run your fingers over my face? Ah. Suffer dishes can make rough hands embarrassingly smooth. We evolved out of slice of life, although you'll still see some of it on television today. And we, we got into what was known as lifestyle advertising. And this was revolutionary for its time. And Pepsi was the first. And the concept went like this. Let's not exalt the product. Let's sort of glorify the user, the consumer. And out of this idea came the Pepsi generation. The 80s gave birth to celebrity advertising. And while celebrities had been used to some small degree in the past, Ronald Reagan was the spokesperson for General Electric. Eye-catching, isn't it? Celebrity endorsements have been a gold mine for advertisers throughout the years because buyers place their faith in their favorite stars, whether using a famous face or a well-known voice. Hello. Advertisers find some celebrities worth millions. Star power will always be a mainstay in commercials. In the 90s, however, companies such as Reebok have returned to the product demo style of advertising with a brand new twist. a little better than your ordinary athletic shoe. Advancements in technology have been the most exciting influence on commercials of the 90s. created a no-holds-barred attitude within the advertising community. You don't know who wrote Moby Dick? No. You don't know who wrote Moby Dick? Mm, no. The one with the whale? I saw the movie. But you never read the book? So what? So what's Moby Dick? Look, I don't know who the f wrote Moby f***ing Dick, okay? Okay. You basically have all boundaries as far as sex, as far as sexuality, as far as women's roles, men's roles, the racial lines have all pretty much been dropped. But we're trying hard to make a baby. Trying is hard. Yeah, trying is uh, fun. I think he'll be a good dad. I think he's got the qualities for it. Oh, the law! What we've tried to do in the IKEA campaign is show lifestyles, total lifestyles across the spectrum. I came to IKEA because I'm recently divorced and needed to get some furniture to replace some things that are gone. <laughs> so whether it's a divorced woman, whether it's a family with three kids at home, whether it's an interracial couple, whether it's a gay couple, whether it's um, a single person, is just people living better and how IKEA fits into that. Hi, I'm Zach, the new dork across mm -hmm. the street. Do you have any kids my age? There have been a couple of commercials in particular that have garnished a lot of attention. Particularly, IKEA, I think, was the first um, 
uh, broad advertiser to depict a gay couple buying furniture, and they just happen to be two guys buying furniture. Well, you know, we went to Ikea because uh, we thought it was time for a serious dining room table, and we have slightly different tastes. I mean, Steve is more into country. It, it frightens me, but at the same time, I have compassion. <laughs> These chairs are really sturdy. This table concluded a leaf. A leaf means commitment. staying together, commitment. We've got another leaf waiting when we really start getting along. Advertising, which sometimes we think of as a cutting-edge medium is really behind the times when you think about just the, in every medium where you know the gay culture is just very very prevalent in our society very kind of almost a given at this point that advertising just caught up in 95 96 is almost kind of sad and embarrassing for the industry i did a commercial for lifestyle condoms and basically it was the first time anyone ever connected uh, the use of condoms by young people to protect themselves from aids I never thought having an intimate relationship would be a matter of life or death. But because of AIDS, I'm afraid AIDS isn't just a gay disease, it's everybody's disease. And everybody who gets it dies. I was turned down by just about every network. I vowed that my commercial would get on the air. And when I got into a real argument with one of the local networks, I said, how can you do this? He said, we have a rule. And I said, how long have you had this rule? And he said, since the 50s. And I said, you know, rules are what old men make and young people die from. That's why I'm so bright. Her laundry's so white. She'll be bringing home the bacon. She'll be making tonight. She never was a flower, but now she's in power. She's come a long way, baby. The only people who were really treated worse than men in commercials were women. The thing that bothered me the most is that these commercials talking about soap, and talking about wanting your floor to sparkle were written by women. And that's the thing. I mean, they were written by women who never, never, never cleaned their floor uh, because they made enough money writing that stuff so that they could afford a maid. In the early uh, 50s, uh, the type of women who colored their hair were often considered of, you know, questionable character. So Clairo had a brilliant marketing idea, which is to tell women that when you colored your hair, uh, no one would know. Let's keep this news quiet. For every woman concerned about her hair color, now there's a shampoo in color that works. The, the end benefit of coloring your hair, rather than being something that was just making you feel good in the 50s and in the 60s, was much more about male approval. Is it true blondes have more fun? You've only one life. Why not live it as a blonde? Champagne pops for blondes. Men adore you. Do more for you. Life is tops for blondes. Why not be a blonde and see? Just switch to be witch. You had mom at home. You had mom in a, in a little skirt with her apron on, waiting for her good husband to come home, the 2.2 perfect children. That's what our society was. It was post-World War II. It was man in his place, woman in her place, and that's what you saw in the advertising. Now, from banquet comes. <laughs> what is it, Cynthia? What is it? Giblet gravy and sliced turkey. Yes, giblet gravy and sliced turkey, together in the most significant frozen dish of our time, buffet supper. Winner of three Banquet Academy Awards, best sliced turkey. Best performance by a giblet gravy in a supporting role. Best performance by a housewife. I just put it in the oven, and by and by it was done. And I had a delicious buffet supper. Oh, yes, I did. Slices of turkey, all covered with gravy and little bitty giblets. Do you hear me? The outstanding banquet production of the 20th century, giblet gravy and sliced turkey. Color by Paprika, now appearing citywide in a frozen food section near you. When it comes to how women are portrayed in advertising, I don't think advertisers ever mean to show women in a role that they don't feel they're already in. I did do a, a terribly anti-political commercial, very, very bad, uh, very politically incorrect spot many years ago, which at the time was quite benign. Nowadays, it would never have gotten on the air. It was called the Airstrip. And it, it starred a, uh, a young uh, airline hostess who was showing off Brandis new uniform. And what we did was we, we literally put her in a burlesque uh, situation where she took her clothes off. They, the, the, the uniform was layered, and it, as, you took, as she took things off, different parts of the flight, and then she finally came down to these kind of sexy culottes, which were the final, uh, her final uniform in the flight. 
not only was did it get on the air without any complaints, but it was a huge success. And we used to have um, businessmen calling Braniff and saying things like, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm on, I'm on your flight to, to Dallas today." He said, "But I'm getting off in Dallas. So we might, I know the plane goes on to Houston. Am I going to miss anything?" So you know, it, it, that would never have happened today. Impossible. You're gonna love Clairol's new herbal essences, shampoos, and conditioners. You'll be overwhelmed oh, wow. by the organic herbs, oh, the all-natural oh, botanicals, so good. drenched in pure mountain water. Oh. And if you find that exciting, oh. wait until you see your hair. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. I want to get the shampoo she's using. We're even seeing commercials um, like we've done for Herbal Essence Shampoo which uh, says, you know what, women can really have their own orgasms. I've never lost a woman a shampoo, so I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's really going to do it. I could almost give an argument that that's almost insulting in, in a strange way, you know, that, that um, I don't think shampoo is going to be the answer to empowerment, self-sufficiency. Throughout time, people have shown a lot of cosmetic products that are very, very sensual, so I don't think that's new. I think the smart advertisers in the late 90s and as we hit the new millennium are going to stop trying to define a woman's role and talk to a woman the way we talk to a man. Mom, mm -hmm. I've got to ask you something real personal. Mm -hmm. Do you douche? I sure do. But only with Massimo vinegar and water. Why vinegar and water? That's what my doctor recommends. For a naturally fresh feeling, only Massengill has two vinegar and water douches. Pure, extra mild, and extra cleansing when you need it. You'll see how clean and fresh Massengill makes you feel. Massengill, trusted by more women than any other brand. I'm not a big fan of we're all absolutely equal and absolutely alike. There are differences. I think the differences should be acknowledged and recognized and, you know, the right case celebrated. But to try to say men can understand absolutely every woman's product, there are some uh, that they just can't. Uh, they cannot have children. Maybe someday they'll be able to, but right now they just don't understand. Or some of those products to avoid cramps would have been invented a lot sooner. Advertising was really just holding a mirror up and saying, this is what it looks like. And now that's what advertising is doing today. Showing men as being vulnerable, not being as macho as perhaps they once were portrayed. <laughs> It's you, Harry. For a minute there, you startled me. I got some pizza. Pizza? Harry, I don't have time to make pizza. Did I say anything about making pizza? It's frozen. See? Gino's. Gino? I didn't know they made a frozen pizza. It's right there in the freezer section. You think Gino's wouldn't make a frozen pizza that bakes in 10 minutes for people in a hurry? Thank heaven those days of being abused by frozen food are over. As women have changed, advertisers have had to change their approach. Women have much more independence now, so they can demand a lot more respect, and we have to show them a lot of respect when we do our advertising, which isn't to say we can't have fun with women, but we do need to show them a tremendous amount of respect. Every year on Christmas Eve, just before midnight, my dad and I take a walk. Just me and him. I can see him now, hear the crunch of his boots on the snow. 
Our breath would hang in the air as we trudge past the barn. My cheeks would get so red they'd start to hurt. Toes would be numb in my boots, but I'd never complain. Just try as best I could to follow in my dad's footsteps. Never quite making it. The thing you want most in your advertising, as it's shown on television, is to have consumers say, hey, here comes that great commercial again. Uh, if you can pass that test, uh, I think you're on your way to a real success. We'd keep on in the moonlight till we made the clearing at the top of the hill. We could see the whole valley spread out below. And there we'd stand, the two of us, and wait for Christmas. This will be the first year I won't be able to come home and take that walk with my dad. But at least a part of me will be there. Wish we could be together for Christmas. No need to count the many miles that separate us now. Because the memories we share will keep us close somehow. Merry Christmas. Love, Sarah. father started saving for my college education. It was my 10th birthday, and he opened the savings account for $10. Brian, he said, you're going to have it better than me. You're not going to have to stand on your feet all day just to make a buck. You do the studying, and I'll do the saving. He had it all planned. There was only one thing he didn't plan. He didn't plan on dying. I think a commercial that recently uh, emotionally had a lot of depth was one that we did for Ford uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the automobile. We actually ha had a reunion with people who worked side by side with Henry Ford. My name is John Anderson, born in 1914. And uh, my age is 90. My name is George Hartman, I'm 101. Uh, I worked for Ford for 44 years and seven months. I started off as a car washer. One other thing that I found incredibly emotional about the commercial was that in this society, we tend to disregard elders. We tend to think the young generation knows best. And here was an example of an immense amount of respect and appreciation for these people who are well into their 90s, many of them, some in, into their hundreds, for what they started with Henry Ford, for where it all began, for getting back to the roots. And uh, it just really makes you feel wonderful about uh, the company and uh, the society as a whole that respect elders. The best advertising talks to the heart, talks to that emotion, talks to a human truth that doesn't change with time. What you're really doing is you're reaching out into li literally from the screen and you're pulling the viewer in. It's difficult to do, but, uh, but it's very doable and very memorable. Peter? Peter, the bell rang. School's out. You can go. I know. I just wanted to tell you something. I mean, my mom. She wanted me to tell you something. My mom wanted to thank you for helping me out with my reading because she thinks it was really nice of you to take all that time after school and during lunch and even that one day before school just to help me learn how to read better. Because if you hadn't spent all that extra time with me, I probably wouldn't be able to read much of anything. And my mom just wanted me to thank you. And Peter, this is from me. Merry Christmas, Mrs. McGow. Thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. McGow? Want me to read it for you? I'd like that. I'd like that very much. There are some special people you need along. Nice to Emotional commercials are also the best approach for organizations who are not selling anything. My wife is always getting on my case about smoking. She said it's bad for you. It makes the drapes smell. 
she even threatened to stop kissing me if, if I didn't quit. I said, it's my lungs and it's my life. But I was wrong. I didn't quit. I had no idea the life I'd lose wasn't mine. It was hers. Because she was my life. My wife was my life. Emotion, getting in people's hearts, will always be a huge part of advertising because it's a huge part of what we are. Katie was just six, the youngest of our children. She was a little tomboy, funny, spirited, full of life. When she died, we donated her organs so that another might live. To say thank you is so inadequate. Tommy is our only son. What a gift you have given us. Yesterday, Tommy did something we never thought possible. Yesterday, he turned six. Become an organ or tissue donor. Give someone the chance of a lifetime. There's a commercial for the Olympics that was just incredible. Suppose that's him? Just don't know who else would be out this early. For the Caldwells, early morning's the best time to get things done. And times being what they are, not much would make them shut down, even for a few minutes. But this summer of 1984, the Caldwells have shut down to see something they'll most likely never see again. the games this summer, let's hope we all learn that the true measure of the Olympics is not in the winning, but discovering the best in all of us. Does advertising reflect society, or does society reflect advertising? That is the question. Boy, do we have some answers for you. I think there have been these wild swings as to how we portray people in advertising. But all of it is representative of how we see ourselves. That's really what it's all about. We're not putting out, we're not putting out advertising that people would look at and scratch their heads and say, well, I don't get that. I, I don't understand why they're doing that. It's generally uh, reflecting the way we are today. Hey, Pete, do you ever, um, you know, talk to your wife? Yeah, every day. What kind of question is that? No, no, I mean, um, I mean, uh, do you ever, um... A wrench, please? Oh, right. This will do me no good. Yeah. I mean, you ever see that, uh, that stuff to where, like, um... What um, stuff? Well, like, uh, Oh, you mean like, uh, yeah. when you, you know, when yeah, you, like, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. No, I don't. But you still feel that, right, for her? Oh, yeah. 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 Just, you know, she doesn't expect me to say it, that's all. No. She expects me to say I love the bears or, or I love ham, yeah, you know. But right, yeah, right. That's about it. Why, you say that stuff to your wife? No. No. But I've been thinking, though, you know, I, I'm... Yeah? Yeah. I'm gonna give her something. Something that uh, tells her how I feel about her. <laughs> something really great, you know? What, you mean like bears tickets? That'd be great. I think um, commercials reflect society in a, any number of ways, um, be it humor or warm and touchy-feely kinds of advertising. But essentially, the idea is to not be a step ahead of what's happening in, in America, let's say, at any particular time, or a step behind, but to be right in lockstep with what's going on uh, in the moods and mores and temper and tempo of the times. It's about time Jockey came up with black underwear. Godfrey Cambridge for Jockey Underwear. And this Boy, commercial definitely reflected red. the tempo well, of the times for African Americans in the 1960s. Whoever said underwear has to be white anyhow. People come in colors, don't they? 
So I'm flipped that Jockey is doing something about it in a big way. Giving us underwear in so many colors and styles that the mind boggles. Including some numbers that not only look like paint jobs, but fit like them. Listen, I'm hip that underwear is a small thing. But isn't it nice that we're finally getting a little freedom of choice around here? You find that um, with certain advertisers, they tend to sort of make the leap a little bit so that you kind of set the trend rather than follow the trend. When we're talking about what advertising's role in society in terms of does it mirror society, does it, does it lead society, my, my feeling has always been that essentially it, it, it follows society, it mirrors what's going on. One thing that has changed in society and commercials is the way that fathers relate to their children. Once, kids were only thought of as adornments. <laughs> you know, the way I look at it, I haven't lost a daughter. I've gained a dandruff shampoo. <laughs> now they are seen and heard. Dad, wake up, what? Dad. Get up, Dad. What is it, Jack? It's Saturday. You said you would take me to McDonald's for breakfast Saturday. Yeah, uh, and you I said know. I could have an egg meat muffin and a big juice. It's 3.30 in the morning. Oh. we got plenty of time, okay? Okay. I'll be back in exactly 10 minutes. Ads have also reflected the change in the way men relate to women, unless it's a really beautiful woman. Looks like you need some help, huh? Oh, do you speak any English? No, no English? No. Um, would you marry me? Marry? Yeah. Here you are. Marry Svensson Clausen. Oh, Marry. Svensson Clausen, uh, how about a Coke? Coke? Coke. A drink. Why is it not? Um, Coke. Okay. Cola. Yes, Coke. Coke and a smile makes me feel good. Swenson Clausen, where to? Oh, you're down to the next gas station. So, advertising has been a mirror of society, constantly reflecting its changes. The thing that doesn't change, whether it's a slow message or a fast message or a hundred cuts or one cuts or new technology or not, is a simple selling proposition, a simple idea that has some human truths to it. That's the great advertising that stands the test over time and stands what I'll call the technological movements and ebbs and flows of time. The one thing that doesn't change is a good, simple human idea. That's what makes great advertising. I can't believe I ate that all thing. Take two, Alka Seltzer. Comet gets off stains better than any other leading cleanser. Mm.